Well, welcome, George, to um, the program today here. We're at CCTV, Town Meeting TV, and we're here with George uh, Weller, who is in Stanistead, Quebec. Um, and tell us a little bit about what life is like up there at the border. Oh, what life was like. Well, um, since I'm an American and a Canadian, um, and we have had lots of groups that we visit and go to, like square dancing and, and uh, the church and Derby Lion, the UU church, um, we cross quite a bit. And I have some, we've had, we have a farm here. And over the last 15 years or so, we have had a bunch of woofers. Um, woofers are W-W-O-O-F. And that is Worldwide Opportunities on Organic Farms. And all of the woofers from Europe um, are kind of curious as to why they can't just go from Canada to the US. Because in Europe, 26, 27 countries agreed about 30 years ago that you could just travel without stopping at any border point between them. So if you fly into, say, uh, Paris and you want to go to Zurich, well, you just drive or take a train or to Seville, Spain, or to Rome, Italy, uh, any of these 27 countries, you can just go. So I have been thinking for several years now, maybe 10, 15 years, um, of maybe trying to get a system between the US and Canada to establish a border that would be open for people to go across. Uh, you know, just by going. Uh, this, of course, both Canada and the US have their own laws and their own regulations. And that's the way it was with all those 27 countries, but they figured it out. So I think maybe we can figure it out here in North America. Um, and you are, you are part of an organization. Um, so there's a lot there, which is you're talking about this is, you've noticed this over the last 15 years, a sort of tightening around the border. And yes. you're part of an organization called Can USA. Tell me a little bit about when this organization started and what's the structure of the organization? What are you trying to, what are you trying to achieve? Well, what I was saying was um, we're trying to achieve a set of laws between Canada and the US so that people could travel back and forth without having to stop at customs. Some kind of a system. Um, a system would be everybody has a microchip implanted in them and you just go across and uh, buy a booth or something or, and they scan your microchip and they know if you're okay or not. But uh, they don't have to do that in Europe. Um, they say if you're in the zone, you can go. Um, the, I was in a committee, uh, a Newport Airport committee, and we had a meeting um, of people down at Burlington Airport about commerce uh, in the aviation industry, uh, aviation uh, construction and whatnot, uh, building parts for airplanes uh, between Montreal and, and, and Burlington. There's several companies and they wanted better uh, uh, crossing. But also um, they had a, 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 um, a person from the, uh, from the the groups that um, expedite commercial shipping. Um, forget the name of them right now, but anyway, um, they have changed the time frame for a truck going across the border from maybe 20 minutes to about one minute. Everything is checked ahead of time. All the information is put in a email to the customs. And when the truck gets there, the driver can just show them what he's got on a document. And the document comes up on the officer's screen. So it goes really quick. I've sat at customs 
waiting to go across the border in a car for maybe three or four or five minutes, and I've seen two or three or four trucks go by. Um, so anyway, there should be something that we can do for people. Got it. I see. You're saying at the you're saying at the currently at the Canadian U.S. border they have created systems to allow commerce and trucks to move more quickly, but the That's same true. system. Now we certainly we do have a nexus system. Talk about why the nexus system doesn't work or isn't enough um, in your mind from from your experience of living at the border. Okay, um, we have a new customs operation, a new facility at Derby Line on Interstate 91. And they didn't even put in an excess line. The Canadian Customs on Route 55 on the Canadian side, they have one and it's not open all the time. So, um, yeah, at the airport it works better, but in cars it doesn't. So the Nexus system is is being used at the airport, but not as much at the at the borders in Alberg right. or, um, right. yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so anyway, what, um, yeah, what's your what's your instinct? I mean, what's your what's your research and your experience telling you about why the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, for example, which would be sort of the North American equivalent of the European 27 countries, why can't it work here? Um, well, there, Canada has uh, a different medical system and a different dental system than the U.S. And so uh, they charge extra tax to cover that. Um, the U.S. does not necessarily everywhere charge a tax for the medical uh, or dental. Um, so the systems just need to be harmonized between the, between the two and also uh, guns and drugs and all these things that uh, need to be harmonized between the two countries. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, we need somebody who, or what we need to do at the beginning is to I have, okay, back at the beginning, I have set up and incorporated as a nonprofit the Canusa Project, Inc., and worked with Marina, and uh, we have a website there, and um, we have started, uh, I took out the, the nonprofit organization, so we have a, a, a legitimate company to work with. Uh, we have a website with a with a name, um, but we need uh, we need a uh, a committee of interested people, um, a steering committee of U.S. and Canadian members, and uh, then of course we need a website manager. We need uh, some researchers and inquirers people. Um, when I've gone back and across back and forth across the border in Quebec, uh, between the U.S. and Quebec and, and U.S. and Ontario and the U.S. and British and um, uh, Nova Scotia and, and uh, well, no, New Brunswick. Uh, I've talked with people in businesses on both sides and they say that it's, uh, it would be a lot better for their business if we could establish something that would make it easier for people across the border. Um, in Rock Island and Rock Island or Stansted, Quebec and Derby Line, Vermont, the businesses on both sides have been suffering terribly. Um, much of them are closed because of the lack of ability for people across the border easily. Um, and of course, for years, these border crossings were much more easy, much more easily crossed. Right. Is, how long have you lived in Stanistead and been in that area with Derby Line? To, how, how, how has it changed over the years since, really, I would say, the impact of 9-11 and closing and really shutting down border crossing? Well, if you go back quite a ways, when I was a kid living in New Jersey and coming up with my 
parents in the summertime to the place where I am now, which was a historic house. It was kind of run down, but we were here in the summertime. And um, we would go back and forth, just wave to the customs officer. They knew us, and that was it. I learned swimming with the Three Villages swimming project. And many times, for many years, it was a U.S. bus coming and picking up Canadian kids and from uh, from uh, Stansted, Quebec, BB, Quebec, Rock Island, Quebec, um, Derby, Quebec, Derby, Vermont, um, Derby Line, Vermont, and uh, taking them down to the swim project in Derby on Lake Salem. And then sometimes there was a Canadian bus that picked up all the kids going to the US and taking them down. And then after I moved up here in 1970, I don't know when it was, but maybe 72 or three or something, um, there was a US school bus that came across to pick up the Canadian kids. And they got stopped by the uh, Quebec police because there was no Quebec license plate on the bus. So they weren't allowed to do work and picking up kids. So that stopped it there. So then the kids went to the library, which is on the border the Haskell Library, which is built right on the US-Canada border. And the kids would walk across the border into the bus. Well, that wasn't legal, really. So then the officers, customs said, well, you got to go to the customs. Well, then the kids coming at the customs in the morning and then back uh, in the evening created problems with traffic. So then the whole project was stopped. And it's really too bad because it was started by a Canadian Red Cross um, lady, uh, Ivy Hatch, and a US Red Cross lady, uh, uh, Ann Aldridge. The two women, both Red Crosses, they started this project to teach kids how to swim because there are too many kids drowning. So over time, it's just gotten more and more tight. And it's just not a good, I think it's not a good thing. I think it should be more open. Yeah. And you are working, you do have um, quite a bit of support from local mayors in Quebec are in cities and from folks along the the border talk about the support that you do have and who's involved in this project the Canusa project okay I uh, I got re council resolutions from Stansted uh, approving the idea uh, the project uh, from from Stansted from Stansted East from the MRC, which is like a county of uh, Quebec, of um, Quaticook, the Irish Cliff also, um, all the local areas. And I had a committee of three people from Canada and three people from the US. And we worked on this project and we thought, well, maybe we can work with just the customs. And the customs people say, well, we just enforce the law. Um, we can't do anything. You got to talk with the politicians, and then the talk with the politicians. Um, they they say, uh, "Well, that's a, a nice idea, but who's going to vote for me for this project?" So I think that has to be a popular movement of some kind, and I think um, not people like in the Midwest, uh, Ohio, um, Nebraska, or. Uh, anyway, they're not too interested in the border. It's the people in the north that are interested in the border. And I'm working on just Canada and the U.S. at the moment. Yeah. Uh, it'll be, I think it'll be easier between Canada and the U.S. than Canada, U.S. and Mexico. Yeah. But um, so anyway, well, what? Well, I'm curious. I mean, you, 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 if not including Mexico, is some of that have to do with What's the role that immigration, or what what people call illegal immigration, play in the fears around having open borders? 
How does it affect what you're talking about or not? Well, one of the interesting things about illegal immigration, um, if somebody wanted to come into Canada and didn't have a Canadian passport or the, the, the right to come into Canada, if they went to a port of entry, they would get shipped back to their own country pretty much automatically. They have to come in a place that's not a port of entry, which means they have to come in illegally. So when they come in illegally, then the RCMP picks them up, takes them to the customs, and then I guess gives them a meal and gives them support and, and then they go and wait for um, paperwork to happen. I don't know if that's the same on the Mexico US border or not, but it seems that the way the laws are working, you cannot come in legally through a port of entry. You have to come in um, illegally somewhere else to be able to stay in the country as a, as a refugee until your case comes up, which I don't think most people understand that. So you're saying in, in, in your mind, it doesn't really affect this idea of open borders. People would come to the port. What does it look like in, um, in your mind? What, it, what are you envisioning that would happen at the Canadian border? Okay, if, if things happen the way I hope they could happen, um, Everybody in the U.S. and everybody in Canada legally, people who are legally in one of the countries, one of the two countries, could legally cross the border without stopping at customs. But in order to do that, you have to harmonize the laws and you have to harmonize uh, whatever taxes there are or some system for taxation. Um, so you have to have a political will and a legal uh, framework. And this project, <laughs> this won't be done in a year. It might not even be able done in 30 years, but I think it's worth trying. So it really has to do with harmonizing our political systems. I mean, it, that's what we're talking about in Europe is 27 countries that have relatively similar, you know, have created basically the European Union and we could have the North American Union, but you're talking about harmonized political systems. Right. Um, one thing that people don't understand in North America is, um, or most people, a lot of people, um, there's the European Union and there's the Schengen area. The Schengen area is 27 countries that agree to let you go back and forth freely across the border. The European Union, there's tw two countries that are different, um, different ways. I understand. Got it. Um, so this is more market. than, this is I not guess, just... I, I guess you'd say it's the common market. The yeah. common market is different than the uh, Schengen area by two but, countries. But this is more than, uh, so what you're talking about is a project that's much more than just about the borders. Right. Yes. Yeah. It's a, I guess it would be a long-term project. Yeah. But there's a lot of people that uh, would benefit by being able to cross the border easily. And a lot yep. of businesses that would benefit by having people able to cross the border easily. Is, you know, is this, um, what, what, is it, what are the impacts of having the border like this? Is this just an inconvenience? Waiting in line a half an hour? What are some of the impacts besides what you've already talked about? Um, well, the impacts that I see, some people on the Canadian side are ha and have been for the last, since the middle of COVID, almost afraid to go to the U.S. They just don't want to even go near the U.S., uh, which is quite strange. But then there's also U.S. people who are saying, uh, well, we have everything in the U.S. We don't need to go to Canada. So, um, you know, it, it makes 
communication and commerce uh, less. So you, this is more than just like uh, making it easy to pass through this one point, but really opening up relationships between the two countries. Yes, it's, that's exactly what it is. This is what's happened is the relationships have have uh, shrunk. They've <clears throat> they've been less. If you uh, if you don't communicate with a relative for quite a while, pretty much they become. Um, you know, it's strange. I mean, they don't know what you're doing. You don't know what they're doing. And it's just not as nice as if you are communicating with them. And, you know, from my point of view, I feel like the Vermont, you know, the local Vermont government or the statewide government does a lot to try to build relationships with Canada, with Montreal, with Quebec, Toronto, Ontario. Um, but what's not working for you, from your point of view, what's your point of view on that? Well, um, Quebec is a special case, but um, between English-speaking Canada and the U.S., um, I think it's much easier. Uh, Quebecers, uh, most of Quebecers who go to the U.S., they go to uh, more French colonies kind of in Maine or, or Florida or, or whatnot um, because a lot of Quebecers don't really speak English very well and of course Americans don't speak French very well and recent laws in Quebec mandate that um, businesses have to operate in French which makes it more difficult but um, anyway th that doesn't have a lot to do with the with the Canusa project. It's just uh, business-wise that makes it more difficult. Um, so, what is the mission of the Canusa project? Because it sounds like it sounds like it does have a lot to do with what you're talking about in terms of open borders. Is you know aligning our systems of government, aligning our values, aligning our medical systems, right? But what is the mission of Canusa? Well, Canusa project is to uh, really start the ball rolling in a uh, in a in a way that involves a lot of people, uh, having a lot of people, the, a popular movement that is interested in such a thing, because the politicians won't move unless there's a popular movement. And the uh, customs won't move unless there's a, I mean, the, 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 the legal system won't work unless there's a popular movement, making the laws and all. The, um, the, politi the and politicians, but the, the customs there, they can't do anything unless the, the laws make it so that it's possible. And is this very practical for you, George? What's the what's your impetus behind this? Is this ideological? Is this practical? Are you a man who doesn't believe in borders? Is this what what drives you personally around this? Um, what drives me? Uh, <laughs> well, I'm certainly not making any money at it. <laughs> um, so I guess it's uh, altruism or the wish that people would um, be able to uh, be more friendly with each other, um, the wish that uh, people would understand each other more uh, rather than become more estranged. Um, yeah, I guess that's pretty much it. Um, I also am a pilot and I've flown across the border uh, not recently, because they've made the, the uh, aircraft rules for small planes more difficult, too. Um, but that's a whole whole different ballgame. Um, yeah, I, I have people that I, ha I built an airport on the farm here with my son, John. And uh, we have planes that are based here. I'm also on the airport committee in Newport, Newport Airport. Um, but there's a, a problem with small planes crossing the water. And it, 
and have a fly-in the second Saturday in September. Uh, this will be the 14th year in a row. And if people could come across the border, then plane, little planes could fly across the border too. And I'd have to go through customs. Yeah. Uh, so I haven't, in all the time of all my plans, I've not been able to get anybody to come from the U.S. because it's just too hard for a small plane to go to an airport of entry like Montreal or, or Bromont or way up to Sherbrooke and then come back again because my, my field is only a mile from Holland, Vermont. Yeah. So if somebody does fly from a, if somebody does take off, say, from the Burlington International Airport in a small plane, they have to fly all the way to a designated landing strip of entry, register right. with customs, and then they can fly around Canada where they want right. to go. Right. That's the way it is yeah. Now. yeah. I did get the chance and once to take a small plane over the border and see how clearly the line is designated from the air. It's a fascinating picture to really see a whole, con you know, basically a country divide, <laughs> a continent divided. Divided by a cut strip of woods. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know how wide the strip is, but it's probably uh, 50 feet wide. Yeah. Cut from the Pacific Ocean all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah fascinating symbol of something that we think we can control. Um, a really interesting, funny thing. Um, on the Mexico, Canada, Mexico, US border, they built some wall there, like a steel wall. Okay, somebody, some politicians or whatever have suggested, well, why don't we build a wall between Canada and the US? Well, that would be really challenging engineering wise because you've got to build a wall right down through the middle of the Great Lakes. And you've got to have a place for ocean liners to be able to go through carrying cargo. So they're going to have to go through a port of entry in the middle of the lake somewhere, either Lake Erie, Ontario, Superior, why not? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, <laughs> it's quite a joke Yeah. because it's impossible. Yeah. So you're a farmer by trade and you've been working on this project since the mid 2000s. Is that right? Um, what is next yes. for you with this project? Um, well, I'm not a farmer by trade. I mean, I guess a farmer by um, just doing it. We, uh, I went to, um, to college and have a degree in chemistry and physics. Yeah. Then I went to uh, Dartmouth, the tuck school, and I have an MBA. And then I worked for five years for a corporation in Ohio, uh, owns Illinois. Had some really good jobs and made a bunch of money and then decided to uh, go on my own. I guess I had an early midlife crisis after my mother died, and then my brother, who was a Navy pilot, his plane crashed, and he was killed. And I decided to just go on my own and do, do my own thing. So we either got to move to Homer, Alaska, or which was a place that we saw when we took a trip across Canada and down to Mexico before I started work in Toledo. Um, either Homer, Alaska, or Stansted right here where my ancestors were, where my parents bought this place from relatives. And then I bought it from, from my dad. But anyway, um, so we moved here. And then um, we decided to grow our own food, cut our own wood, try to be as independent and self-sufficient as possible. And so that's the kind of thing that we've been doing. And we've had woofers, like I said, We've uh, tried to help people learn about um, being independent and learn about how to use nature to, uh, to help you. Like we have, uh, I built some ponds and we have a gravity feed water line from the bottom of one of the ponds down to the house. So we have free water. We also have a well, but we have free water. You just turn a valve and you have free 
water because I have a, I built a water treatment system in the bottom of the pond uh, to allow water to flow as much as the pipe can carry down to the house. Um, I'm an inventor, uh, haven't made any real money at inventing yet, but um, I've, well, I, when I was a kid, I kind of invented the rotary lawnmower with a wagon and an electric motor uh, before the before the rotary mower came out. But I I didn't have I didn't um, take the time to go and make a, a shield for the blade, and I cut the top of my shoe off. And my father oh. said, um, "Yeah, you know, more of that." But two or three years later, the rotary mower came out. <laughs> um, I learned about. I learned about uh, marketing. Um, I learned to sew. My brother was sewing drapes for the new house that we moved into. She had a bunch of drapes to sew. And I learned how to sew. And she had a vacuum cleaner that took the, uh, paper bags. And I thought, well, why don't I make a cloth bag and put it in the vacuum? And then you could just take it out and shake it out. And you don't have to buy these bags anymore, paper bags. And she thought, whoa, that's a great idea. So my mother took me, and I was like 14 or yeah, 14, I guess, um, into New York City, which is about 30 miles to the east of us, and uh, took us to Lewitt Vacuum Cleaner Company to the president. And she said, my really smart son here has figured out making a cloth bag for your vacuum cleaner. It's wonderful. And he did not want to see us anymore. Yeah. They you were, you were money taking money out of his pocket. Bags than vacuum yeah. cleaners. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that's part of marketing. <laughs> yeah. That's neat. Also, well, yeah. another thing, um, the person living next door to us uh, lived in a castle. His name was Goobelman. I don't know how many people know of the name Goobelman, but have you ever heard of the mechanical adding machine? No. Well, it was before the digital editing machine and the computer. Yep. Mr. Goobelman, who was our neighbor, he had as many patents as Edison did on this machine and other things. And his wife was a teacher supporting him and supporting his, defending his patents against people who were just making uh, mechanical adding machines. And then one day, a man from Remington, Remington uh, calculators, um, came to him and said, um, how about if you give us a free license to do our calculators and we will depend, we will, uh, uh, prosecute anybody who is using your patent illegally. So he signed the papers and he was almost a millionaire instantly because Remington had deep pockets and they could defend all of his patents. And so IBM, National Cash, Burroughs, all of the companies had to start paying him. Huh. That's the way that works. You can have a patent and that's wonderful, but if you don't have the money to defend your patent, yeah. then it doesn't do any good. Yeah. Well, George, this is fascinating, interesting to talk about. Um, I certainly like to get up to Montreal and drive across the border and enjoy some time in Quebec. And to do that more easily, more seamlessly would be enjoyable without the anxiety and anticipation of crossing and whether you're going to be able to be allowed in and you've had all your papers in order. What is next for the Canusa project? And if folks want to know more about it, how do they find out? Okay, well, um, they can email me directly, uh, gweller at ctq2.org. Um, they, if they really want to, they could give me a call. Uh, 8762819 But what we really need is people who are interested in um, 
in developing the project, working on it, uh, we can, I'm pretty sure we can get donations from people. And if we get donations, then we can actually pay people to go do some of these jobs. But they have to be people who are, uh, who really want to do such a thing. Um, at the beginning, there's no money. Um, there's only uh, volunteering. But hopefully, um, we start getting donations or grants, then there will be some money to go ahead. Um, so I guess what we need is uh, initial people to, to volunteer to, to, to help, especially people. Well, Marina, Marina is really good with uh, computers and internet, but we do need people who um, are good at uh, soliciting uh, information all across the border. Yeah. Great. Researcher well, type. Yeah. 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 Well, thanks for uh, telling us about it and telling us a little bit about yourself and about why this is important to you. And for folks that are watching, thanks for watching CCTV. And um, we'll have this and other programs for you available if you keep on watching. <laughs>